Hi, my name is Mike Montaigne. I'm the communication coordinator here at the Rock Bible Church. And on behalf of myself and the staff, we want to just thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube page. If you live here in the area, we would love for you to come and stop by and hang out with us on a Sunday morning. Our service times are 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. Now, if you haven't liked and subscribed to our page yet, go ahead and hit that like button, and that way you can get a notification anytime we drop a video. Now, I'm going to go ahead and let the sermon start, and I hope it has blessings upon your life, and God just really speaks to you through the message. You guys have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you around. So, man, I'm excited. We are in uh, 2 uh, Thessalonians. We have been going verse by verse through this book. And remember, this book has three themes, and, and, and we're making a shift uh, in this book in 2 Thessalonians um, and, and focusing on misinformation. Uh, he's been giving encouragement for the last couple verses, and now he's going to be addressing misinformation. And, and, and we as a church, we as a Americans, we understand misinformation, right? It's called fake news nowadays, right? You know, fake, I'm, I'm going to try to do a horrible Donald, and Trev, Donald Trump impression. Fake news. Yeah, it's bad. Uh, uh, it's not good. Um, but we understand that concept of fake news. We understand the concept of misinformation. And so what Paul is dealing with here is this misinformation that this church was dealing with. And so for us, what I want to do today is go line by line, section by section through these five verses and kind of pull out the nuggets uh, that God wants us to, to see and to instill in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to look at it verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> now remember, the theme of this section is the return of Jesus should bring hope, not fear. Paul's point here wasn't a, uh, uh, the purpose of his writing wasn't to write some end time doctrine, but instead was meant to comfort a hurting church, to, to steady the hearts of those who are feared, uh, fearful, and anxious. And so as we dive in, keep that in mind that Jesus' return should bring hope to believers not fear. So with that, let's dive in looking at verse 1 for the first part of it. It says this, Now regarding the arrival of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to be with him. Pause really quick. Um, I just love it when an author tells you what he's about to tell you. That when you see it, you go, oh, okay, so now I know this little section, these next few verses, this is the point. We don't have to dig deep. You know he is going to be talking about the return of Jesus and how that impacts believers. Okay, rest of the verse. He says this, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be easily shaken from your composure or disturbed by any kinds of spirit or message, or letter, allegedly from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord is already here. Pause again. See, Paul was getting to the heart of the matter. He was addressing this fake news, addressing these uh, false things. For the past couple verses and the past couple sermons, he's been addressing this concept of encouragement in the midst of persecution. And now he makes the shift to this false information and hits it head on. Point number one I want you to get from this passage is I want you to see a plea from a spiritual father. One of the hardest things about pastoring a church is pouring my heart out time and time again to God's people and watching them walk away from the truth. Had conversations today, uh, or this week, with a pastor friend of mine, and, and um, he has three families in his church right now that are at complete odds, not speaking to each other, not talking to each other, and... Um, and he's, he's, he goes verse by verse through a book, and he's going through John right now and dealing with forgiveness. And he's like, he knows he's preaching on forgiveness and loving one another, and his heart is broken uh, for his sermon that he has to preach, praying that those people are in the room to hear it and respond in a positive light. And I started to dig, why do they not like each other? Why do these three families not like each other? 
It's because the son broke up with the daughter uh, at some point in time. And I'm like, well, how old are they? Seniors in high school, college, all this stuff? No, they're like eighth grade and ninth grade. And I'm like, get over yourselves. It's like, <laughs> quit being helicopter parents and let them figure it out. And, and, and I'm devastated for them, but the reality is week after week, you hear the truth, and week after week, people walk away. The way Paul phrases these verses here, he is making a plea to his congregation, a plea to this church to, 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 uh, to get it through their thick skulls. Much like a dad uh, speaking to a son. If you could only hear me in this. But fear has an interesting way of distorting reality and making it hard to listen to, to biblical truths. We've all been there. We've all been at a place where we can't listen to godly advice because we're too busy acting crazy. Or you have that sister that brother, that aunt, that cousin, that friend who you give biblical advice time and time again and they never listen to it because they're too busy in their drama. One of the, the quotes or the statements my dad used to say uh, that I never understood until I became a parent was, son, I don't speak just to hear myself talk. Anyone else say, everyone else say that? Anyone else experience that? I never understood that sentence because when he would speak and he would say, son, I don't speak just to hear myself talk, my thick head goes, that's exactly what you're doing because I know everything, you know nothing. Now, fast forward, (laughs) fast forward to me and I see my children having the exact same face that I used to have uh, and going, how did my dad not kill me? Like, I w- w- walk through that. And then the worst part about it is on some of y'all's faces, when you come to my office and you say, Pastor Nate, I have this problem. How do I solve it? And I say X, Y, and Z. And you look at me the exact same way. Time and time again, we have that. Um, I remember, Britt, we had the opportunity uh, to uh, consult with the church. They flew us to Pennsylvania um, a couple years back, and Brittany and I had the opportunity to spend three days with this church. This church was dying, um, but their, their community was, was booming, much like ours. Uh, and so they wanted to know what they needed to do. And so we spent three days with them just s- driving the community, spending time in the community, talking to leadership and seeing the church and their facility. And it's a be- it was a beautiful facility. Um, it, one of those that I was, je- you know, I walked in. I was like, God, you got to guard my heart because I'm, I got church building envy. Like that's what I had. Uh, and, and they were dying. And so after the three days, we kind of sat down with leadership and, and the church and kind of laid out. Like, these are the things that need to change for you to, to grow and reach your community. Um, and one of the biggest pushbacks I've got is, well, pastor, we've been doing it this way for 100 years. Why should we change? In church, fear of the unknown can cripple God-loving people. See, Paul was dealing with this. At some point in time, liars have crept in, wormed their way into this small, struggling church, and started spreading lies about the return of Jesus, saying that Jesus has already come back. That even said that Paul had taught this, and Paul was teaching this, that they had missed the resurrection. And for a church who was going through persecution, this was devastating news from them. It gives three, Paul says, three things that distorted them. The first thing he said was spirits, which would be uh, more like false prophets' feelings. The the second thing would have been messages, which would have been just a misguided sermon. The third thing would have been a letter, which is a strategic maneuver to establish poor doctrines. Give me a few moments to unpack. The first one would be spirits. This would be a false prophet's feelings. Most likely what this was, was a charismatic spirit or a charismatic speaker who felt the Lord. And felt the Lord told them they need to do this. And so they stood before the congregation, talked to them in their small groups, and said, at this point in time, I feel God is saying this. And it wasn't God speaking to them. It was the bad burrito they had that morning. 
And too many times churches, time and time again, feel led by God without the Word of God to back it up. And for a lot of churches, they abuse spiritual gifts to accomplish selfish goals. This in no way is church motivation. This is church manipulation. This church was dealing with that. The second would have been messages. Most likely would have been misguided sermon uh, or sermons. Uh, This is probably a good speaker with bad theology. Uh, We'll talk more about that in the later verse. Uh, And then lastly would have been letters. That's interesting because this is a strategic maneuver to establish poor doctrine. What it appears in this letter was people were forging letters written by Paul. I dove into this and started to study more, uh, and this was actually a common practice back then. Someone in the church uh, would, uh, would want a bad doctrine uh, for maybe their selves to be elevated, maybe their selfish desires to be elevated. What they would do is then write a letter and then show up to church on Sunday and go, hey guys, I got a letter from Paul. Let's read it and do exactly what it says and completely lie to the congregation to get their own way. This is why other parts of Scripture, Paul says, I'm sending my companion Timothy. I'm sending my companion so-and-so with you so that you can trust this letter. Even in one passage, one book of the Bible, Paul says, hey, check my handwriting and make sure it's the exact same handwriting so that you don't get misled by these false doctrines and these lies. And you may be sitting here go, well, why is that important to us? Why is this in any way, shape, or form important to us? Because since the start of the church, since the beginning of the church, false teachers have been present. Which means, just because it says it's Christian, doesn't mean it's biblical. Let me say that again. Just because it says it's Christian, it doesn't mean it's biblical. This is why Paul tells the church in the following verse not to be deceived. Look at verse 3. It says this. Let no one deceive you in any way. Again, just because it says it's Christian doesn't mean it's biblical. The life of a believer, you and I, have to be a biblical one because we are bombarded with false messaging, not just from sermons. Each and every one of us, every day, has to fight to have a biblical worldview because bad theology, bad worldviews will creep in if we do not have our guard up. And we may think something sounds true just because it sounds pleasant to our ears. And we have to avoid that. The second point I want you to get is this. You and I have to have discernment and good theology over feel-good speeches. False teaching will lead a church into fear and anxiety. This false teaching that Jesus has already come back has led this church to fear and anxiety because it takes their eyes off of Jesus and places their eyes on themselves. It elevates our problems and our desires above God's authority and his power. Most of the time, you then turn God into a butler or a genie. God, do what I want you to do. Accomplish what I need. Serve me. And we take our eyes off of his plan and we place it on our own wants. And in case you've forgotten, you do really poorly being the center of attention. When you make everything about you, as a loving pastor, I want to encourage you, it will never end well for you. But in a moment of weakness, we've all been there. In a moment of weakness, a moment of rage, a whisper comes into our eyes, our ears. And at that moment in time, we take our eyes off of Christ and we put it on us. We throw our pity party, woe is me. And we forget time and time again, it is not about us, but it is about the God who works through us. Last week, we had the wonderful joy of talking about the grace of God. That all good things that happen to us and happen through us only happen by the grace in which God gives us. 
This is why you and I as believers, as a corporate whole, as a church, we need to have good theology. But individually, each and every one of us, we need to be actively growing and learning in our faith. I love how one commentary words it. It says this, the church faces the constant threat of deception because Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. His servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. To avoid being deceived by the constant barrage of demonic lies, believers are to no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness uh, in deceitful schemings, as Ephesians 4 tells us. They must be alert to those guilty of adulterating the word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, who deceive the hearts of the unexpecting, Romans 16, 18, knowing that as Christ's return draws near, evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, 2 Timothy 3.13. And we also know that there are already many deceivers who have gone out into the world, 2 John 7, 1 John 2, and 3. Church, this is a sobering reminder to each and every one of us to be on guard, to have a spiritually healthy state of mind, to be constant learners and constant growing in the faith. You have to actively be pursuing your faith, not just holding off to what you learned when you were a child in Sunday school. Courtney, who did a wonderful job this morning, um, she plays the piano and she also teaches. And she uh, has been teaching my Carly, my 10-year-old. She's been teaching my Carly uh, piano. And for the last two months, three months, she's been uh, having little flashcards, coming home and reading what notes are and, and, and telling us what a vibrato is and all of these different things that I don't fully understand. But uh, for my Carly, if you know anything about my Carly, um, memorization isn't her strong suit. But she lights up when you hold up, what is this? Oh, that's an A, Daddy. What is that? Oh, that's an E, Daddy. What's that? Uh, and, and all these different things. And, and, and I hear her go in her room. I hear her practicing her little songs, and, and she is crushing Mary Had a Little Lamb. Like, crushing it, ladies and gentlemen. Like, we sit outside her room as proud moms and dads just hearing, hearing that song over and over again, crushing it. She has a good foundation right now because she's a good teacher. But if she doesn't take that foundation and put it into practice, if she doesn't keep actively putting that foundation into practice, it's going to become weak. When I was about her age, um, I wanted to play drums. My parents put me in drum lessons, and because I'm uh, thick-headed, um, I didn't practice. <laughs> I didn't learn. And now, fast-forwarding many years later, I can't even clap on beat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> That's the same concept for you and I in our faith. If you're not active in your faith right now, I can guarantee you a biblical worldview has somewhere crept into your minds, has somewhere led you astray, which leads me to point number three. Good theology can steady loved one's hearts. Look back at verses three and four. He says this. For that day, talking about uh, the return of Christ, that day will not arrive until the rebellion comes and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The son of destruction, he opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. And as a result, he takes his seat in God's temple, displaying himself to be God. Now you may read that passage and you may be thinking, wait, Nate, this is supposed to steady our hearts? Like, this is, like, sounds like scary stuff here. You have to remember who this passage was written to. We have the wonderful joy on the other side reading it, but you have to remember, Paul was writing to a struggling church 
who was being persecuted, that there was a high possibility that some of the members were killed because of their faith. And they were still gathering and they could only press in and push in on each other because that's all they had. And in this little tight community, some people have weaved themselves, wormed themselves in and told them, hey, by the way, you know that rapture that you're looking forward to, that return of Christ that you're looking forward to, that'll make all this bad stuff go away? By the way, you missed it. And Paul's been teaching that you missed it. Do you imagine how devastated this church would be? How crushed this church would be? And so Paul is steadying their hearts. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. A couple things have to happen first. You're good. Steady your hearts, church. Keep pursuing Christ. But the difficulty is for us. We're not in their context. We're on the other side of it. We're not being persecuted. These don't bring us uh, words of encouragement. We put our little tinfoil hats on and we start reading this and going through all of this and go, oh, what he's meaning here is Jeff Bezos is the Antichrist. No, 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 I'm sorry. Mark Zuckerberg, he kind of looks like a, a lizard man, so he's definitely the Antichrist. No, 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 no. Elon Musk. Elon Musk is the Antichrist. And we get out of this and we weave our way into bad theology instead of actually understanding the passage is to steady our hearts that God is coming back. When I read this passage, you may be sitting here and go, well, what, what does it mean about the end times? And I can tell you a few things. Here's what it means. Number one, something is going to happen. Don't know when. Totally don't, not sure what, but something is going to happen. Second thing this passage tells us is someone's going to step up. No clue who, no clue when, no clue how. The third thing this passage tells us is lies will be spread and bad things will happen. That's it. But regardless of all of that church, our God is still on his throne. That our God knows the exact day, the exact hour, the exact season, the exact moment that he will return. And for us as believers, the end time is not a scary thing. The end times is something that should bring us hope as we long for his return. Even if things get bad for us, like really bad for us, we can cling to scripture where it says, this life is but a moment. Even the youngest in this room, her life, but a moment compared to all eternity, church. Loved ones, steady your heart. Steady your heart and allow God to show you that he has got this. Moving on to the last verse. Verse five. Surely you recall that I used to tell you these things while I was still with you. It's a simple statement from Paul, but it shows a profound truth. Paul's already taught them this stuff. Paul's already encouraged them with stuff, and he's just gently reminding them, hey, come back. Go back to the things that I have already taught you. Last point, and we're done. This is a reminder from a spiritual father. I'm blown away and absolutely humbled when you guys come up to me, and you go, hey, Pastor Nate, Remember that sermon you preached three years ago? And remember those points you, you told me and all those different things? Man, I'm still applying those to my lives and I'm still blown away by it. Hey, do you remember that sermon series blank that you taught or that book you went through, you know, six years ago and blah, blah, blah. And I am humbled because I've forgotten it, but really blown away how it's applying and working in your lives. It's sobering. But it's also convicting that what we do every single week, it matters. Every week before every sermon, church, we pray for three things. These three things are vital for the health of our 
church. And, and for some of you, if you were honest, the three things, it's become a ritual. I mean, for some of you, if you've been in the church, I've been doing it for eight years now. If you've been in the church for the last six months, I could pick any one of you out of this room and say, hey, can you come stand up here and you, can you lead our church through these three things? And each and every one of you, probably verbatim, could say everything that I'm going to do. You matter. All these different things. We pray for the distractions in the room. Not the, the, all of you could do it. And if you were honest, you would say there are times Nate, when you're rambling about the three things, I zone out. And I get it. I get it. Listen, I'm the one saying it, and there are times that I zone out in the midst of me saying it. But I truly believe that praying for these three things is probably one of the most important things we do here every Sunday morning, except for the response to the preaching of God's word. Because we are inviting the Lord to speak on our, to speak to us. That we are not gathering here to just be a part of some cool kids club. No, when we gather, when you gather here every week, you are gathering here to be inspired, to be encouraged, to be nourished, to be instructed, to be empowered, to be challenged by God himself. This is why we pray for the distractions over your heart. Because a silly little argument you had with your child right before you pulled up is weak and compared to the God of all universe speaking to your soul. That anger and frustration uh, that you have towards another church member is weak in comparison to the God of the universe speaking to your soul. And I go back to my buddy's church to think that he has three families now. And I, and I wonder, all right, this boy broke up with this girl. What does this family have to do with it? That's what gossip is. And that's how gossip destroys other people. But that's a completely different sermon. Um, but the reality is these three families are absolutely distraught. And they're sitting on opposite sides of the church. And there's only less than 100 people in there. It's not like I can't see you, you know. And they stand up and they worship and they glare and they anger at somebody and their hearts are so bound up, they can't even hear God speak. And sometimes praying for the distractions in the room means that you have to get up and move. And you got to come before someone and go, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry I offended you. I can't think of the times in eight years that I've had to look at Brittany and be like, that argument we got into last night, we got to resolve it now because I'm about to go stand and preach God's word and I am humbled and sorry that we had to do that. And y'all are thinking, oh, they're all together, they're loving each other. And she's like, I was really mad at you. And I was like, I know I was so mad at you too. And we love each other and come back and we repent of those situations because we can't even allow the distractions in our hearts, church. It matters when you pray for the distractions. The second thing, when you, um, when you pray for me, you can't hear from me. I need you to beg week after week, God, move that man out of the way and speak to my soul, Daddy. I need to hear from you. I want to I wanna close. I want to finish with a story because our faith, our good theology, should lead us to God-centered actions. Each and every one of us. And I'm reminded of this story. I'm, I may have shared it in the last eight years. If I have, I'm sorry. Um, but um, I think it's vitally important. It says this. An old man approached a, a speaker uh, and told her this. I lived in Germany during uh, the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian and I attended church since I was a small boy. We had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews, but like most people today in this country, we just tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. What could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church, and each Sunday morning, we would hear the whistle from the distance, and then we'd hear the clanking of the wheels moving over the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday... We noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized that the train was carrying Jews. They were like cattle in those cars. Week after week, that train 
whistle would blow and we would dread to hear the sounds of those old wheels because we knew the Jews would begin to cry out to us as they passed by our church. It was totally disturbing. We could do nothing to help these poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly what time the whistle would blow, and we decided the only thing to keep from being uh, disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns at the exact same time. By the time the train came rumbling past the churchyard, we were singing at the top of our lungs. Some of the screams reached our ears. We would just sing a little bit louder until we could hear them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it much anymore. But I still hear the train whistle in my sleep. I can still hear them crying out for my help. God, forgive all of us who call ourselves Christians, yet do nothing to intervene. And you may be asking, Pastor Nate, why why do you even share this story? Because church, we're a corner church. And on any given Sunday, as we sit here and sing our songs, hundreds of people pass by every hour, every service many of which are being herded off to destruction because they do not know Christ. Each week we pray for three things. Two are for us. One is for them. May we never get so comfortable so comfortable in our our cushiony seats that we forget all those that drive by. And I know we're close to the road and I know that at any point in time a a motorcycle will, will rumble itself by. A punk kid with a fast car will rev his engine at the light every time why they do that, uh, or under bridge passes, underpasses, but that's here nor there. Um, and I find myself time and time again as I'm preaching or worshiping and I hear the rumbles pass or this, I find myself sometimes in my sin annoyed, frustrated. Don't they know what we're doing in here? How dare they disturb what we're doing in here? May we never be annoyed by the rumblings of the cars, but may we always be brokenhearted. That God, you have called us, your people, to carry your light out into a lost and dying world. And so today, as we conclude, Typically, I call for us to come to the altar, and I would encourage you, come to the altar if God has called you to. But today, as we sing the last song, as I close out in prayer, I want to close out in prayer anointing the seats. Being challenged that this week, this week, may each and every one of us have an opportunity to share our faith, to tell someone about the good news of Jesus that has saved our souls. And may we have the courage to take it. May we have the courage to step out and just do what God has called us to do. May this week, may God's people rejoice in the proclamation of the gospel. Let me pray for us.